My name is Amanda Kovach, and I'm the Creator of Education here at the Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami. Before proceeding, MOCA acknowledges that we stand on the current and ancestral home of the Seminole and Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. We further acknowledge the Calusa, Yaega, Miami, and Tequesta peoples, all historic caretakers of this land. We honor and thank them for their past, present, and future stewardship of Southern Florida. Funding for this program was provided by City National as well as uh, through a grant from the Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed to this program do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to my partner, Director of Community Engagement, Adrienne Chadwick. She's got an exciting opportunity to share with you all. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, everybody. How are you? Like Amanda says, I am here with great news because if you got a raffle ticket and if you didn't, you should see Lauren, you will have a chance to win an original DDA Williams screen print entitled Toise Bronze. And DDA has donated 200 prints to distribute to residents of North Miami um, in order to create a tradition of having art in our homes and living with art by local artists and artists from Haiti and the Caribbean. Um, and so today we are going to do a raffle. And this is the print. So we're gonna do three, three raffles. Okay, so where's the drum roll? Can you hear the drum roll? Zero, 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 two, three, five. I told you that. You got it? Oh my God. <laughs> Department at Dickinson College, an independent curator. Her research and teaching focuses on interdisciplinary American culture, history, art history, and visual arts of the Caribbean and the African diaspora, with an emphasis on the Francophone Caribbean. She has published numerous articles and exhibition catalog essays, including a text on contemporary Haitian diaspora art and artists for relations undercurrents, contemporary art of the Caribbean archipelago, her essay on modern and contemporary art of Haiti, Martinique, Guadeloupe, is forthcoming in Harvard University's The Image of the Black Western Art, Latin America, and the Caribbean. She is the recipient of a 2020 Andy Warhol Foundation Art Writers Grant. 
with Catherine Smith. She is co-curating an exhibition on the contemporary textile works of the Haitian artist Mirlan Constant for the Fowler Museum UCLA, which opens in March 2023. So book your flights now. She is completing her book project, The Socially Dead and Improbable Citizen, visualizing Haitian humanity and the visual aesthetics, and is working on a monograph on the Haitian modernist artist, Luce Tournier. Dr. Philogen, please lead us in conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for that lovely invitation. And thank you all for being here tonight. This is fabulous. Such a wonderful um, audience and a, for a wonderful exhibition. So thank you so much. I want to thank Amanda, uh, Lauren, and Gina for um, organizing this really fantastic event. And I'm looking forward to having a conversation with some of my favorite artists and for getting us all together here, because that was definitely a feat. So thank you all for doing that, uh, Lauren. Amanda and Gina. Uh, my, thank goes to, my thanks go to Erica James for curating this amazing exhibition. And I know that Erica wanted to be here and was unable to, but thank you very much, Erica. And of course, for Didier for his spectacular work. It's just been such an honor and a joy and a pleasure to know you in all these years. So merci en pile, merci en pile. Thank you. So I just want to say a few things about the exhibition, and then I'm going to introduce the um, the artists in the way in which, in the uh, section in which they will be speaking. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the works that in the current exhibition that we're looking at now, Nous um, Quittez Toutes Sadeye. I'm fascinated by these works as they offer a wonderful insight into Didier's fantastic artistic development and his articulation of different conceptual understandings of color, materiality, and space, as well as history. His creative practice is deeply informed by his upbringing in Miami. In this, we see the ways in which he approaches, um, approaches composition and form, as well as the concepts of time, and dare I say, storytelling. There's lots to see in the works in which we're looking at. The works in this exhibition are replete with luminous grounds and gestural drips that foreground the unfettered chromatic expression. Didier's techniques result in the compositions that are simultaneously joyous and foreboding, telling us of the joys and challenges of living in what he has called the beautiful conditions of diaspora. This particular view is necessarily global and historical. It imagines, it, it imagines a continual making and remaking of the world that makes way for varied cultural interpretations of elements that we all share. Sinewy lines, seemingly frenetic curvular marks, guide our eyes to the ways in which Didier balances abstract sensibility with expressive organic har harnessing and challenging viewers' perceptions of space and free movement. The works gathered in this exhibition create a dynamic synergy that, in profound ways, highlight the meditative nature of creative practices that tell us about the livability of the human condition, and namely, the beautiful condition of diaspora that imagines the world in a different way. And in that imagination, Haiti, Haiti's spiritual and revolutionary traditions and its symbolism are central to black diasporic visual and cultural traditions. I'm excited to be joined by such talented artists on this panel and look forward to our conversation. So I'm going to introduce each artist in the order <laughs> that they will present their work. And then we'll have a brief conversation, pas vrai? And then we will open it up for a conversation with the audience. So first, I'd like to introduce Morel Dosset. He's a Miami-based multidisciplinary artist and arts educator that hails from Haiti. His work utilizes illustrations, ceramics, and prints to discuss the impact of climate gentrification, migration, and displacement affecting black diasporic communities. Through a contemporary reconfiguration of the black experience, his work catalogs a powerful recording of environmental decay at the intersection of economic inequity, the commodification of industry, personal labor, and race. Morel's work has been featured and reviewed in numerous publications, including Vogue Mexico, The New York Times, Oxford University Press, um, Biscayne Times, PBS, Miami Herald, White Hot Magazine, and the Berlin Journal, and a few others. Moel graduated from the New World School of the Arts, along with some other people in this room, <laughs> with a distinct, distinguished Dean's, um, Dean's Award for Ceramics, 
From there, he continued his education at the Miami Institute College of Arts, some, like somebody else in this room, okay? See the connections here? We're all... I am in Miami. Okay, thank you. Maryland, thank you, Donna. Maryland, in Maryland Institute College of Arts, receiving his BFA in ceramics with a minor in creative writing and a concentration in illustration. Morel had ex has exhibited extensively in national and international institutions, including the Havana Biennial, Biennial the Venice Biennial, the African Heritage C Cultural Arts Center, and many, many others that you can find on his website when you look him up. Next, I'd like to introduce Mark Floydo. Mark explores his personal history and lived experience through painting, quilting, collage, and pattern making. Recent solo exhibitions include Sunshine at the Young Gallery in my Young Arts Gallery in Miami, Florida. Recent group exhibitions include include at the James Fuentes Gallery in New York, Untitled Art Fair with Johannesson Johannesson Project in Miami Beach, Florida, and Superong in West Water in New York. In addition, Mark has participated in several arts residencies as institutions such as Art Omai, Anderson Ranch Arts Center, Vermont Studio Center, and Oli Light Arts in Miami, Florida. Mark is a recipient of the Knight Arts Champion Award 2002 and also recipient of the Olight Arts LE's Award in 2020 for his public art project being held. He's also been a he's also a visiting lecturer at Florida International University and Auburn University. Mark holds a BFA in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Art. Perfect. And then I'd also like to introduce Michel Lisa Polissin. C'est vrai? Polissin. Is a Haitian American visual artist and art organizer based in Miami, Florida. She's a, res she's a resident artist of Bakehouse Art Complex. She holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree from Florida International University with a concentration in photography and fiber arts painting with a minor in art history. As an artist, she explores the nature of human interactions through textiles and photographs. She produces community-based activations and encourages artists and community members to form collaborative relationships. Most recently, she was the Education and Community Engagement Manager at OLEI Arts. Oli, Oli Light Arts, thank you. Where she created community-based education and outreach programs focused on artists of all ages, including the Teen Arts Residency, the Artist Toolbox 101 program, and the Sustaining Your Practice program. Previously, she's held leadership positions in various cultural organizations, including Locust Projects and Miami Rail where she can uh, conceptualize and produce public programs and engagement initiatives. She has two projects that she's working on right now. One is called If Home Was Home, and the other, The Ballad of Me and You. And hopefully, we'll get a chance to see that today. Okay, so we're going to have five to 10 minute presentations <laughs> by each artist, and then I'll have a few questions that I like to ask them, and then they'll probably have questions for each other, right? And then we can open it up to the audience. So thank you very much. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's a absolute pleasure um, to have all of you guys here this evening. Um, and thank you guys for coming out and embracing the traffic. Um, it means a lot to us up here. Um, so I would like to go first um, by going through a few slides um, that kind of talk a little bit about my personal background and how that has influenced the work that I make today as an artist. Um, so the first slide behind me, um, talks a little bit about the navigation of being a young Haitian immigrant here in South Florida. Um, I left Haiti um, in the early 90s. My parents were being politically persecuted, and so my parents were able to receive political asylum to come to the U.S. Um, upon our entry into the U.S., we were dropped in Mobile, Alabama, and we lived there for six months. And Around that time, I was age three, and for me, um, the idea of the changing landscape has always been embedded in my psyche. And so even though at a young age, um, I was able to understand that I was no longer back in Haiti, and I was in this new country, in this foreign land, and I didn't understand the English that was happening around me. Um, but throughout my schooling and upbringing, uh, my mom 
has been very adamant in me staying in school, being a good student. And you'll see a little bit of that in the presentation. Um, so for um, elementary school, went to about five or six different ele elementary school. And then for Nolan Middle School, New York School, the Arts for High School, and then Micah in Baltimore, Maryland um, for college. Um, next slide. So this is some pictures of me. Um, I've always been very, very serious um, growing up. Um, they used to call me Little Pastor. Um, and so the last picture of me taken in the, back in Haiti was me standing next to my two aunts. And then one of the earliest pictures of me in the US is me holding the horse. Um, next slide. Um, going back to my mom who is in, in the audience, um, this is a email exchange I had on Facebook. Um, with a former teacher. And if you kind of just read it very quickly, um, she talks about how my mom was very adamant in putting me to school in very neatly pressed uniform. And so, you know, with, with, with my mom, you know, if you send, if, if when she sent me to school, she expects me to come back clean. And so I was always very particular about not getting my clothes dirty, being very well put together, and being respectful of my teachers. Um, next slide. Um, but then this is some of the work I was doing in high school. So in high school, um, I was very much interested in the idea of the double consciousness and how that in effect um, connects to the environment, um, human and nature and things like that. Um, next slide. Um, and then this is some recent work I've been working on. Um, this is an ongoing body of work titled Daughters of the Copper Sun, um, which essentially explores how women from Latin America and the Caribbean are the epicenter of everything that takes place. Um, even during Haiti, during the earthquake, while the men were fighting and creating chaos, it was the women that was organizing and making sure things were being run in a very efficient manner. Um, and so this work, um, lend itself to that um, story of how women are woven into the culture. And then also um, within the work that I make, um, ceramic plays a very significant role. Um, for me, ceramic is the only medium that transcends space, time, and history. Um, if a archeologist can look back in our human history and understand a lot about our past civilization. So we can understand the dietary need of that of the um, society, we can understand the medicine that they took, we can even understand the history based on the designs and patterns that are left behind. And so I, I say without ceramic, um, a large majority of our human history would be missing. Um, and then I also work with a lot of porcelain, because porcelain as a material, um, there was a point in our human history where it had the same monetary value as gold. And so in a very indirect fashion, if you went to someone's home, one way for them to kind of flex is by having a piece of porcelain somewhere on the mantel or in the front entryway of, of their home. And so porcelain was a symbol of being sophisticated, a of symbol of, of, of status and class. And so by using that to explore the nature elements in my work, I'm bringing that same kind of reverence as well. Um, next slide. Um, and then again, some past work um, I've explored um, that includes porcelain in reference referencing nature and the environment. Um, next slide. Um, this is a body of work called Follicle Cells Baeta, which was looking at the fragility of the coral reef and comparing it to the fragility of being black in America. Um, and the colors are directly inspired by Haiti and the Caribbean. Um, and then thinking about you know, Haiti as a conglomerate, Haiti as a unit and how the people, the um, traffic, the day-to-day -day life is very, multiple, um, I'm kind of recreating that, that rhythm and beat in these pieces. Um, next slide. And then this is um, a work I kind of wanted to um, juxtapose. They're from two different years. Um, one of them is called Tea with the Queen, um, which is looking at the idea of Haiti getting back reparation from the French. Um, within our Haitian history, um, as slaves, we were forbidden from drinking tea and drinking soup because our slave master um, deem those were very refined and sophisticated things to do. And so as a slave, you, you, you could kill um, a um, deer, a cow, um, the slave master wouldn't care, but you were forbidden from having soup and drinking tea. And so I created this unique, overly embellished teapot that references the French Rococo period of time. Um, and what, what 
items would we use if this conversation were, were to take place between the French and Haitian government? And then the piece next to it was a commission piece that I did for American Craft Magazine last year's spring issue. And it was a piece that paid homage to the assassination of the Haitian president. Um, next period. Um, and then, you know, within my work, um, I, ref I reference a lot the um, landscape. So I'm very much looking at the landscape here in South Florida in Miami, as well as the landscape back in Haiti. How the, the over time, the land has been completely scraped of trees, of nutrients, of soil. And so if you look at the image above, there's a juxtaposition between Haiti and the DR and how there's a very stark contrast between the two countries. Um, next slide. And then some work I was exploring back in, in, in college, the idea of cultures that are often deemed to be tribal. But for me, um, I find the tribal cultures that Western deem as being tribal to be very much sophisticated. They're in tune with the nature, with environment, um, and things like that. Next slide. Um, and then that was the last one for me. So I'll pass the mic to Mike. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. My name is Mark. Florador, I'm Haitian American, born in born in Opalaka, raised in North Miami. I actually I took classes here at Mocha. I went to Miami Arts Charter School for high school, and I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art for undergrad. And now I'm back in Miami. Um, can you go to the slide before? So to start off, I wanted to show my inspiration, my image references for my art. So I took a lot of film photos growing up in my household. My mom would love to take photos every Sunday after church. And as I got gotten older, we have a photo albums of photos. And I wanted to continue this sort of practice of photographing and archiving stories. And in these photos behind me, there are different photographs that are in artworks that I'm about to show. And so to top right, top right, you can see my mom and my sister holding hands and my dad drinking coconut. And a lot of my work is all about archiving memories and archiving stories and a lot about telling stories of different random things in my life that I really care about. So next slide. So in this artwork, I've, I've changed my style of making from the last couple of years. Before, I was making more figurative paintings of family members. And then one day, I just up and decided to change my sort of making and wanted to create plants that hold memory within them. Within them. And in these artworks, I think of these plants that are alive based out of memory. So in this specific plant that's a flower pot, it shows images, the same images before of my mom and my sister holding hands. And while making art and making art in general, sometimes I don't know what I'm going to make before I make it. So in this piece, I was thinking about my sister, who's a mother, and my mom, who's my mom, and thinking about them taking care of people all of their life and wanting care for them within their life. So this piece is titled, Take Care. And a lot of my art has pattern making. So the pattern making on the sort of table is hibiscus flowers. And this also this artwork is a reference of quilt making. I, before this, I was making quilts and I wanted to make quilts out of paper. So as you can see in this artwork, there's a border of a quilt, and I use glue as a drawing material, archival glue, with, so the line work is sewing, is referenced to a sewing line on a sewing machine. So this is my quilt out of paper. Next slide. And this is another piece that also talks about my, it talks about my relationship with my, my dad, and my dad is a, hard working fellow and how 
most of his life, most of my life, I, he was always working. And recently, back in 2000, in 2020, beginning of 2020, he lost his job of 20 years. And then he was looking for a job and it was really difficult for him to find a new job. And I took a photo of him that's really obscured in this artwork, but there's a photo of him somewhere in this where he's sitting and waiting for his job interview. And within this artwork, I was thinking of rest for him and rest before his final rest and wishing rest for him and thinking of rest as a luxury to be able to rest and thinking about how I'm able to rest because of my parents and the hard work that they've done. Next slide, please. This is a detail. My, um, my friend Philip Carp, he photographs a lot of my work, so shout out to Philip. And this is just, I use a lot of lace fabric, collaging with lace, and thinking about my mom's favorite fabric is lace. And she uses, she's really particular about her curtains and her tablecloths. And I like to bring that back into my artwork and just think about her with that. Next slide, please. These are my newest pieces. And I I recently saw this, I forgot, I, I saw this, this performance through Young Arts, which is a program in Miami. And there are these dancers dancing and interacting with each other. And I've been re recently thinking about movement and dancing and sort of making these figures that are dancing figures of memories. So the left one is has images of my dad drinking coconut water and just creating these beings that are, like I said before, alive based off of memory and trying to create these environments and talk about intertwining memories and yeah, the space of memories. Next slide, please. And this is the last artwork I think I have in the slide. And it's currently up at the Frost Museum. And, and Amy curated a show there. Right? Shout out, hi, Amy. <laughs> and um, this is, I made this in around May of last year. And it's called A Sunny Mother's Day. When I was making this artwork, I was really, in, I have, I look at a lot of different books for references for my art. And for this one, I was looking at a, a book about the sun and I wanted to create a landscape, a luscious landscape out of these flowers. So in the bottom of the piece, you can see small flowers. These are flowers I used to pick from my mom and I'd gift it to her when I was around four or five. And she'd be like, wow. And in front of my yard, I saw these flowers. So I took pictures of them on my phone and I've always and wanted to use them within my artwork. So, and in this artwork, I thought of how children draw a sunscape. So they put a large sun in the corner and a landscape. So I was also referencing that within creating this, this piece just about my mom and me gifting her flowers. So the title of this piece is A Sunny Mother's Day. Yeah, and that, and next slide, I think that's, oh, and that's the detail of the flower and the sun. And yeah, thank you. We're going to skip three slides and go over to Michelle. I feel like a nerd because I'm the only person who put a title slide with my name on it. In between. <laughs> um, so my name is Michelle Lisa Polisson. Um, and like I said before, I'm a visual artist and arts organizer. So some of what you'll see is um, a public program as well. So um, you can, so like the next few slides, you can kind of like, just like tap through if you want. Um, so this is, these two images are from a series called If Home Was Home. They're a photographic series that I've been doing since 2014. When I graduated from my BFA at FIU, my parents gave me a gift, um, which was a gift I've been wanting for a long time, which is a trip back to Haiti. Um, and it came at a really good time because it was the first time since I was like 15 that I didn't have school and work um, because, you know, as a Haitian person, I feel like it's like kind of this like um, 
natural thing to just work. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're, um, I mean, and it's funny because like being next to Mark and um, Morel, they're both like some of the two of like hardest working people I feel I've like encountered in this art world. And so even just like him talking about how he has time to rest, I'm like, I don't know when. Um, <laughs> but um, so I went back to Haiti in 2014 and ever since um, up until the pandemic, I was going back at least twice a year. And I started a series of photographs where um, that were really just for me a way to kind of meditate on being back in this space that I hadn't been in since um, 2010, right after the earthquake, because my grandmother unfortunately suffered um, kind of like a psychotic break that triggered her dementia after the earthquake. And so, um, her health severely, anyone who knows, has dealt with dementia knows that health can severely decline once they start showing symptoms. And so um, after the earthquake was a, the last time I had been there since. And so it was really interesting to go back to the space after one, having not been there for since I was a kid, but then also my first return after being a child was seeing the place that I really loved and cared for destroyed and then watching my grandmother deteriorate. So in 2014, when I was able to go back, it was this opportunity to like re-explore this idea of home, about safety, about connection. Um, so something you'll, I mean, you'll see in my photographs is that a lot of them have like an energy of nostalgia, um, care. So it's a lot about like texture, touch, light, um, portraiture, um, this focus on just kind of um, engagement and human um, experiences with each other and um, also just like this thing of like being interested in um, imagery that I haven't seen in a long time so on the left like I won't speak too much to exact images because take very long time but on the left um, is an image of what was once a major ravine um, that was filled with water all the way to the top um, and that was being fed in from a waterfall and when I was a kid um, and we would go back to Haiti we would actually like go bathing in that ravine and sit under the waterfall. And I have these images of my mother and my siblings and I just like, you know, just dousing ourselves in water under the waterfall. Um, and so kind of revisiting these kind of spaces um, in um, a more contemporary space. Um, and also just thinking about how home doesn't feel as secure when you're the child of immigrants who already themselves are constantly othered. Um, and then being a black person in America, um, there's all the complications that come with that on top of that. So trying to kind of navigate that and then going back to Haiti where you are um, blah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and no matter how much of a connection you maintain, the difference of existing in a country like America or the United States, I have to be clear, but like being in the United States and um, getting to kind of experience a certain kind of privilege here is always going to be a little harder to um, connect with the rest of your family. Um, so you can kind of flip a little quicker because I realize I might be rambling a bit. Um, so a lot of portraits of family members um, and opportunities to make the images that I picture in my head when I think of them or the images that I um, want to just ensure are here forever. I think that's where the energy of nostalgia comes from with this. Um, so um, the next series, uh, these images are going to be more install shots because it's kind of hard to show these images, these pieces in image in imagery. Um, this is the Ballad of Me and You. Um, you can keep clicking. Um, the Ballad of Me and You is a series that I've been doing for some time, um, since college actually. I started the um, kind of maquette of these pieces. And what they are is images of mine printed onto fabric, then embellished with um, different embroidery techniques. And these works are really about me kind of navigating relationships, the breaks of relationships, the beginnings and ends of relationships, um, and memories within them. And so these are some detail shots of that work. Um, and the Ballad of Me and You for me is really um, a meditation on how relationships can exist in our spaces and how the memories of them can kind of manipulate the future, your future. Um, and it's really not, they're not good or bad, they're not like sadder. Most of the work that I do isn't really meant to be this like 
a negative meditation, but more of just like a way to meditate, release, and move on to the next thing. Um, and then the last series, oh, project. This is a project I'll show you that kind of speaks more to the organizing side of my work. Um, it's called Who's the Fool? How to Pack a Le Patch a Leaky Roof. Um, and I wanted to play a video, but I couldn't figure out how to embed it. Sorry. Um, but it's, this is a project I did with my collaborator, Naja Moon. When we were living um, in Little Haiti, you can skip to the next one. Um, and we were living in Little Haiti and this like tiny apartment and we would look out the window and just see our neighbors walking by with bright blue design district umbrellas. And something about that made us super uncomfortable because it felt like um, advertising the neighborhood that is trying to gentrify your neighborhood. And so we were like, what if we made umbrellas for Little Haiti? And we're like, yeah, what if we did? <laughs> and so um, with some support from o Miami, we were able to make a thousand umbrellas for Little Haiti that we hand delivered. It takes a really long time to hand deliver a thousand umbrellas, admittedly. Um, but it was one of the most exciting experiences. Like this image is one of my favorite images, just seeing them popped over on people's porches. Um, we did this, we did like um, public programs where we would like, um, we would join other public programs and pass them out. We went to laundromats. We, um, that image just, that was the second image that you saw was me and Naja when they were like, it's raining and we're not doing anything. And I was like, yeah, we should go outside. <laughs> and so we just went outside and like that day, we just caught a bunch of people in the rain and just handed them umbrellas from the car. And um, we were walking down the street in our raincoats, passing out umbrellas. There was one point where I was actually using an umbrella and saw somebody and like I passed it to her. Um, and it's one of my most favorite projects I've ever done. And that's it. <laughs> I thought I'd have to like send some signal <laughs> bad looks when I would sit over there. But you all kept the time, so that's fantastic. So another round of applause. <laughs> Should be talking in this, right? Sorry. <laughs> We're gonna pick you up up here. Now. Okay, great, great, great. So I have a couple of questions that I sent around because um, we've been in conversation for a couple of weeks now. And I have a couple of questions I sent around and um, there are no particular orders, so I'm just gonna you know, say them and then read them out and then folks can answer however they feel, okay? So the first one that I'd like to um, ask is, the, what has been the most impactful, um, and what has, been, what has had the most influence on your work, on your artistic practice? What has been the thing that's had the most impact on your art artistic practice? I think I can start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that like in general, my practice as an artist and an arts administrator um, is really just about um, making space for myself and then in turn making space for others. Um, just because there's this occup occupation of like physical space that is often, um, it kind of can be pretty difficult for black people, women, queer people, Haitian people, um, immigrants. So all that othering always makes me feel a bit um, excited actually to kind of push back against those things and then also just um, growing up in a household similar to Mark where like photographs were being taken a lot like I used to really love um, sitting because my parents had one of those had a bunch of those albums that have the like plastic you have to kind of like rip <laughs> open and put the pictures <laughs> and like stick it on you know those yeah. And I, I used to love them, and my mom, she was, she was so scattered about things like that. So even there was, I would was like kind of obsessed with keeping them in order. So like, this is from this year, and this is from that year. And my mom, like, she would take out like the pages from my brother's wedding and like show them to people, and then put them in the wrong page and things like that. So I used to love seeing how they would be arranged and moved around. And so I think just being in that home where that was really a big deal was very important. And then long term, my mom was a seamstress. So one day I decided to sew, start sewing in school because I was doing this course. And I remember telling my mom and she was like, but you never learned from me, <laughs> you know? Um, but definitely just like all of those things all come together into this amalgamation of what is my work today. Thanks. Well, yeah. Um, so for me, it's kind of interesting for me. Um, I've never really felt like an artist. Um, when I graduated from, from college, um, I started off as a very young museum educator. Um, I joined the Price Art Museum 
was walking through their hallways with a construction hat. Um, and you know, it was this, in this new building, don't know what I'm here for, but it just felt this conviction to be in this building. Um, and so um, over you know, the next several years, um, just learning of a why museum exists, um, what is art education, and how does that really goes back to the community in the work that I was doing through the museum system. Um, and then once I got to the point where I felt confident enough as a museum educator, um, I think that gave me permission to define myself as an artist. Um, and so I was able to leave the Perez Art Museum as one of their founding educators back in 2013 to leave and start my own journey at ICA Miami, um, which is the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami. Um, and so for me, it was not really until I was in that position at ICA um, and having the experience at the Perez Art Museum where it gave me a, f a more complete understanding of what was an artist, um, why artists were important, and the work I was doing with the community in terms of re representation, um, it gave me the valid, it, it made me realize the, w what I was doing as a individual was important because there was not a lot of black male educators in museum education for me, yeah. Hello. I think that um, my biggest inspiration for my art practice has always been other artists. So artists like Didier and Morel and Michelle has always, and Robert Chambers who's back there, and, and many, and seeing that other artists are able to make a career out of their practice or just making the best work that they can make has always inspired my own practice, I'd say, yeah. And also, you said your mom was a seamstress, my mom was a seamstress, is a seamstress too, yeah. Yeah, I wanna take up that uh, idea about, the seamstress I think is a, is a really interesting idea in terms of the, thing, the thinking about the idea of the hand, the touch, and the kind of physical labor and work that, that comes with that. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. But I'm really excited and interested in something you both said, um, Morel and um, Michel, the idea of space and permission. And I think we had talked about this earlier in our Zoom conversations about having the space and the permission to actually be an artist, particularly in an immigrant Haitian family. And I know we talked a little bit about this, okay? <laughs> and I think we, you and I have talked about this for a bit, right? You and I, Didi, have talked about this. But it, you know, I remember, I mean, I was a, an art major, I was a painting major in undergrad, and I remember telling my parents that I wanted to be an artist, and they were like, I'm sorry, you wanna paint houses? What exactly do you wanna do? No, you came here to be a doctor, a lawyer, and an engineer. And I was like, no, I want to be a painter, but then I became an art, art historian, so whatever. But we talked about this, and I want to know the moment in which you all realize, I'm an artist, and I'm a painter, and I'm a you know, ceramics artist, I'm a photographer. That moment, when was that moment for you all? Because I think that's an, empower, that's an empowering moment, to claim that space and give yourself validation and permission. I think for me, my... Well, what my parents' reaction to me wanting to be an artist was they were very confused. And having my, I ha, I'm the fourth of five children and my older siblings were really supportive. And even though my parents probably did not want me to go into the arts, my siblings were like, no, 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 let him go. Let him do his thing. And for, I forgot what I was going to say, but, um, yeah, my siblings were a big ins inspiration. And as far as realizing that I'm an artist, I don't think there was ever a specific moment for me. Even when I graduated college from art, this is something that's really funny to me, is when I graduated college, college at the Maryland Institute College of Art, after I got my diploma and I'm with my dad and my siblings and my dad looks at me, he's like, it's never too late to change your major. <laughs> And I was like, oh. <laughs> so, but even, yeah. yeah. You can I've still just, be a doctor, you know? You yeah. Doctor, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. been, I, I've never had a moment where I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna be an artist. I've just been doing it and then I'm like, oh, I'm an artist. This is what I do, yeah. 
You know, it's funny about that is like, I think I did. Like, I think for most people, it, I understand what you're coming from, like where it does, there's never been like a moment that did it. But I do remember being, I curated a show at my old job at Ulaid Arts and one of my college um, colleagues came up to me and he goes, you really doing this art thing? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. You know, like that, like that, when he said that, it kind of was like, yeah, I guess I am. And I had been, I mean, this was only what, a, a year and a half ago that that happened or two years. So this was pretty recent that I was like, oh, I guess you're right. You know, even though I've been kind of in the midst of this for a while. So it's, it's an interesting thing to acknowledge. I think there's just been this like underlying understanding that like I want to make art like whether I'm actually doing it or not, like I want to, even like through like the 2020 phase where I didn't photograph anything and only worked on this particular commission I had for the airport because my brain just wasn't doing what I needed it to do. I'm um, even in that still feeling like I am an artist, you know? Um, but it's with, when it comes to like the parental kind of direction, I, so I'm the youngest of five. My oldest two sibling, my oldest sibling was born in Haiti. Um, she'll be, She'll be 51 this year. And then my brother underneath her, he, um, oh, that's so funny, it's such a Haitian way of saying it, underneath her. Uh, my brother, my, young, my brother on younger than her, um, he'll be 49 this year. He was born in St. Martin. And so, and then the rest of us, the last three of us, my sister Yolanda, my brother Joe, and myself were all born in the United States. So that kind of like trajectory for me, I think was really what made my parents be like, you know what, fine, because, you know, my sister, they try to push her to do like med medicine. And then I think she like got into like pre-med and was like, ew, <laughs> like, you know? And then, and so I think once they realized that and she kind of was super unhappy because she had done all of this, this schooling towards something that didn't fit for her. Um, and then my brother got a full ride and then was like, I hate college, which that for them was super hard to understand. Um, and so I think that after, by the time you got down to child number five, you're like, they were like, just don't be destitute because we, we don't know if we can support you forever, right? They were very supportive for a long time, but you know, now they're in their 70s, they're retired. And they're like, every, every once in a while, my dad's like, do you need money? And I'm like, no, I'm good. He's like, well, can I give you gas money? I'm like, I will take it, but you know? And so I think that now at that point they're, and when they're able to sit there and say, my kid is sustaining herself with this thing that she loves, they can feel really safe in that. I even, like I took my parents to my first museum show and like, even in being in that space, I don't think they really understood that it was like this big acknowledgement of their child in a museum. They were just kind of like, it felt more like their response to like a school science project. Like, you know, not in like a negative way, just being like, well, good job. <laughs> you know, nothing crazy, just you good job. Nice award. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's Next like a certificate yeah, of right. completion or something for them. Yeah. Good. Um, so I would say uh, my experience is very much different from Mark and Michelle. Um, I've been in a magnet art program since fifth grade um, in elementary school. So from fifth grade through high school, I've always had a magnet visual arts teacher that's been pushing and ushering me in. Um, and so for me, um, throughout those years, you know, I, I learned technique, um, I learned skill, but I didn't know why I was making the work, you know? And so the why stayed with me all through college. Um, you know, I, I was a high academic, um, like when I graduated from, from high school, you know, I had um, a 4.5 GPA. Um, I could have chosen the route to go into a medical field, but then I defiantly went into the arts because I didn't know why I wanted to become a um, doctor or some kind of lawyer. And so when I went to school, I chose a more practical field where I, it was either design and illustration. Um, I had, again, the technical skills to do the work but I was not enjoying it. Um, and so I didn't really um, find the permission to give myself to make the work um, into my junior year of college. Um, when my, my teacher for design and illustration, who was essentially one of the biggest art directors in the world, um, I realized that um, I did not want to work for another person. Um, I did not want another person telling my stories. Um, I wanted 
to tell my own experiences. I did not want to work for an art directing company. Um, and so during my, after my first semester of junior year in college, um, I changed my major from design and illustration to ceramic, um, which was, a, again, a un traditional field because at that time, I don't even know why, but it just did not feel right for me to work in that industry. Um, and for me, um, unbeknownst to me, it would have been the greatest blessing in disguise. My college um, teacher for ceramic, he had um, his paperwork, he stayed with him for three years. Since freshman year, he was trying to convince me to become a major in ceramic, and I refused. Um, and I was just like, nope, it's not for me. You know, I'll take a couple classes here and there. But he kept it on the top of his desk for three years. And I walked into his class um, after I was done with design and illustration, and he pulled it out. And he just like signed here and signed there. And so the fact that he kept it there for three years um, was again like the greatest thing for me because um, the minute I changed my major, it opened up this complete avenue for me um, that I did not know was available. And then I'm going back to ideas of representation um, so the year, um, because because of the school to college pipeline, so with New World, um, we have this um, incredible um, way where our alums were able to connect with them. So when I was still in, in, in high school, I remember, I don't know if the year even remembers, but I, I called him over the phone, because by that time he was, you know, through, I think you were almost done with Michael, I don't know if you're like a senior at, um, at, at, at that point. And I asked him about what was the experience going to MICA. I didn't have the financial um, money to go visit schools. My, I went on Google Maps. I did a street view. I did winter. I did fall. I said, all right, I could see myself there. Um, and so, but the year was the validation that I was like, if he can do it, then why can I? You know, and so it gave me, so that was like another idea that having representation um, gave me the permission to take the leap of faith. Some great answers. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we can open up to the audience, if that's okay. The one question that I have that's been kind of, you know, in the back of my mind for a lot of the things that I that I am engaged in and writing, especially when it comes to thinking about this idea of the uh, Haitian aesthetic. You know, I'm curious as to what does that even mean? What does that even mean? You know, and so so my question is, um, you know, looking at the you know DJ's exhibition, looking at your works, and we've all seen different styles, mediums, different um, artistic practice and all that. So I'm just even curious as what does that even mean? Is there a Haitian aesthetic? I mean, so if there is a Haitian aesthetic, or you may not think there is, but if there is, what would you, how would you describe that in your work and what would that be? Um, so I have the three images up behind you guys. So I feel like in my experience, when it comes to not even Haitian art, but just Caribbean art, I feel like a lot of artists are referencing mark making and the landscape. And so there's a juxtaposition of myself, Mark, and Dier's work behind me. And I feel like even though the mediums are quite different, but there's a universal connection between the three mediums. Um, so we're, we're um, exploring the black and brown figure. We're exploring ideas of plant, and, and landscape within the work. Um, and then even like the color palettes, like many of our color palettes tend to be very, vi very bright, um, vibrant. Um, and so I feel like when it comes to the, from, when it comes to the Haitian aesthetic, um, A for me is landscape. B, um, it goes back to just articles of clothing, like fabric, textures, pattern, um, and then C, our everyday experiences, um, our this day to day watching our, our our parents work, and how that then and it makes us want to work harder. All right. I don't want to be. Oh yeah, um, it's funny because like whenever I think of like the Haitian aesthetic, I'm not always able to pinpoint what I'm looking for, but I can always see it. Mm. And I think back to the Poto Prince show that was here and previously at Pioneer Works. I remember walking through the space and recognizing these particular through lines. It just felt so, um, just like so significant, right? In that show, you saw a lot of skulls. Um, in that show, you saw a lot of elongated figures. Um, and then even in the work that wasn't maybe explicitly vibrant in color, there was still this kind of like um, 
high contrast uh, in either in like shape and form, like uh, choosing to use like concrete up against like sh these shiny floors or like um, uh, Milan Constant's work and like that vibrant like beating and this like color, these color stories that are always, um, it sometimes feels like pouring as much onto a canvas at one time in a way. Um, and I always am able to in some way look back to the paintings that I grew up buying on the side of the street in Port-au-Prince um, and how it all, I can always put the artwork of a Haitian artist next to one of those and understand that they are related to each other. So maybe I can't say like they are specifically inspired by this particular piece, but they, the, they live well with each other. Um, and it's, it's really quite fascinating because it does feel like um, for all of us, there's this generational um, through line that just exists in the blood and the way that you um, make marks, the way that you move your hand, mm -hmm. the way that you work with the material. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about all of the um, experiences I've had with just, you know, meeting people like in, in the wild and being like, that's my, that's kin. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to identify people as kin. I feel like that is similar in the artwork of Haitian artists. Um, and I, I, I'm always super fascinated by it. I think that's what, like, the Poto Print show is, like, really a moment for me where I was just like, wow, like, we are really one in, one in the same, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it, it's, it is quite fascinating. I think, like, thinking of, like, landscapes, for example, I always, actually, when I make photographs, think of them as landscapes, even if they're portraits. Right. Um, yeah. So it's really funny for you that you said that, because I'm like, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, that's one of the things I noticed in your work when I was looking at the, when you were showing the photographs. For me, what stood out were the landscapes. It was really what kind of surrounded the individuals who were actually in the space. So I think what you've said, Moyel, is really interesting, the kind of mark-making landscape. And the also the, 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 the work with materiality and how we work with materials in different ways, whether that material is paint or whether it's fabric or whether it's beads or whether it's ceramic. So there is this kind of... Um, universal, but yet specificity, I think, that uh, allows us to, uh, you know, as, as folks of Haitian descent, working both on the island, on ha in Haiti, but also in the diaspora, having that kind of, as you say, kinship, as you said, kinship. Mark? We did a really great job. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Okay, all right. okay, cool. All right, wonderful, excellent. So maybe now we can open up to the audience. Is that cool? Okay, good. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, um, I'm currently a New World student and I'm about to graduate very soon. And um, as a student, I would like to ask you, the artist, <laughs> how does it feel to feel um, comfortable enough to tell your story? I feel like that's one of the things that holds me back a lot. And I, I just want to hear what you guys would have to say about um, just being able to tell your stories in different ways and um, different mediums. Um, I think as for me, a lot of, as an artist, it's a lot of making art is choosing what stories you choose to tell and what stories you choose not to tell. And it's a lot of um, very, what's the word, very, um, not, not discernment. It's, it's very putting yourself out there and vulnerable. That's the word, yeah, thank you. Vulnerable is, it's very vulnerable putting yourself and your stories out there. And sometimes you can make work and not tell people what it's about. It's all, I think it's important that you and all artists know that the rules of how you share your stories are all up to you. And there's no specific rules on what you have to share and what you don't share, I'd say, but yeah. Um, and I would say that like, um, put it into constant practice in your life. Like 
I am lucky that my early days in the art world, I worked I worked for Nina Johnson's original gallery called Gallery Diet in Wynwood. And one day she kind of just like made me start talking to people about art. And it wasn't about my work, but being able to have an experience where I was sharing and talking about work um, after, you know, sitting with an artist for an hour, uh, doing a tour of the show privately, and then having to like every day keep talking about this other person's work, um, it really helped putting myself, helping me put myself in their shoes and learning how to speak about it. And I also, I think specifically having had so many experiences where I got to sit and listen to other artists speak, I realized how in, how much it inspired me to to speak more and going to like artist talks a lot. I mean, I went to a lot of artist talks in college and I'm sure you're probably doing the same. It's probably why you're here. Um, and being able to have space to just listen to other people speak. And again, I, I think Mark saying, talking about like choice and like what you choose to talk, to make and what you choose to talk about in your practice, the more genuine you can be about what you're making and what stories you're telling, the easier it is for you to speak about it because you feel passionate about it, you care about it, you feel strongly about it, you think it's important. Um, I think when the hard, it gets harder when you try to tell stories based on what is being expected of you or what is the trend, which is it's hard to avoid because that's how the world works today. Um, but I think that all of those encompassed will help it help you make it a easy, little bit easier for you to speak um, about your work, about why you make your work, about yourself as well. Yeah. So, to piggyback off of Michelle, um, I would say again, um, try to f find your most authentic voice. Don't follow trends. Um, the trends, they there's highs and there's lows. It and it dies off. But your authentic voice is that's what it stays with you at the end of the day inside of the studio. Um, for me, um, I'm naturally a introvert. Um, but what has helped me o over the years is just writing about the work. Um, you know, I during my time back in college, I made it my mission to get my minor in in creative writing um, because I was so terrified of having somebody else tell my own story. And so for me, um, it was very adamant for me that the work that I was making, I could write about it, um, you know. And of course, you know, there's art, there's other people that can take the work and take it into other direction. But I knew that I can make the work, put out a statement behind the work, and I can sit and walk away. Um, so I say, you know, so for you, say whatever is that kind of technique. Um, but for me, I just like write about it all the time. Like all of my titles throughout my work comes from just me writing about the work, like pages and pages about it. So I want to actually keep going on with the writing things. I do think I do think that's really important. And I actually studied creative writing in my associates level, um, and which I, I never really bring it up because I don't know. But um, something about like learning how to write, and also I, I worked for the Rail when it was it still existed in Miami, and have, being able to listen to like artist interviews, transcribing those essays, like that really was a big thing for me. But this is actually a very practical thing that might sound really silly, but if you're working on a project, something that I've started doing is opening a Google Doc and making the voice, and turning on the voice typing, and just kind of saying things about what you wanna do, why you wanna do it, and then kind of looking at it like a word cloud, right? Like, you know those word clouds that would show you like the word that was used the most in an essay or something? Um, and just kind of acknowledging like what what is the important part of that project? And sometimes it's like aesthetic, sometimes it's color, sometimes it's light, sometimes it's story. And that can be a really, like, just like on a very practical sense, something that I find really, um, really helpful in helping you to like write those, those um, essays, statements, or anything to get you started on a project. Um, and I feel like that's like the educator part of my brain that's always like, here's how you can actually do something, you know? Yeah. But. <laughs> The question is really not about uh, what's about the museum hat and really about the collector's hat. Um, you talk about something that you mentioned, trends, and how do you see your work in this new wave and trend of NFTs, um, non fungible tokens? Um, and how do you see your medium trans, uh, transferring or not transferring to this to this new trend right, that's happening? Um, so, yeah, that's. And as a collector, I'm asking that question because that's not a new thing for a black collector's gallery. Uh, so, um, that's what I'm seeing. More people are interested in learning about NFTs, 
and what is the works that artists like yourself can have with I can answer it um, based on my personal medium. Um, so ceramic for me um, is a very important medium for me. Um, and ceramic is human history. Um, with NFTs, for me, it's not tangible. Um, it's not tangible. Um, I like work that you can feel, you can touch, um, that you can live with. Um, for me, the NFT, um, there's too big of a disconnection between it living on this imaginary platform versus having the physical work in front of you. Um, and so while I don't reject it, um, I prefer tangible works. I think on a similar token, it's really hard. I mean, even just like trying to show photos of my textiles is hard. So thinking of, of transferring that to an NFT just doesn't feel right um, personally. And I also just, um, I think the choice of medium is really important for artists. And I think that although I understand that like in gen like the, the concept of NFTs, I understand that there is something that people enjoy about NFTs, but I think the important, it, it, is, it does feel like, um, again, with trends, that you're being expected to make something because of the trend as opposed to um, that medium being the right way to tell that story, right? And like for me, over the years, I've tried to just pick up different skills and techniques. Like I did ceramics in high school, w along with my photography, and I did I actually was did painting on like a pretty high level since I was a child. So like having the ability to make a painting when it feels like the right way to tell a story that I want to tell, or having the ability to make a photo series, or you know I have a forthcoming film project that it feels like the only way to respond to one particular experience that I had as a child. But the truth is, is because NFTs are part of this particular trending discourse, I think that it's actually made it harder to even think of it as a viable medium to respond to the world because it feels so much more about um, getting in early and getting in on that like kind of like opportunity to make money as opposed to making honest work. Um, I mean, I'm a photographer. I could easily just like turn my photos into a GIF or something. But it just, for me, I'm like, I don't really see why I would do it. Um, and I also have this, I think the, and this is like way deeper, but thinking about like AI and all of these different like digital um, concepts that have been very big, especially in the last, you know, three or four years, um, AI went from being this thing that could have been like a tool or an interesting way to um, engage with art to stealing the work of artists and using it to make new work for other people. And I think as much as NFTs were supposed to be non-fungible, they've clearly become fungible. <laughs> and like people have been stealing them and destroying the, the concept of them. Um, in the same way that the metaverse that was supposed to be this like kind of new, um, brave new world and a new opportunity, it's become a, just a new larger silo of capitalism because it's in a cloud and you can just keep making more space for it. And so, not, and I don't rag on NFT artists. I'm just like, for me, I'm like, I understand what they where they fit, and it just, I have no clue why I would make it personally. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Mark's gonna be like, I love NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> just piggybacking off the both of them, I think for me, for my current art practice. I'm, as Morel was saying, I'm really focused on the physical and I'm really interested in collage and physically making things. And it's just not for me right now. I never say never for the future, but for me, it's not what I'm looking at right now. Mark, can you tell us about your show recent, recently, which is about the tangible, not the fungible? At Young Arts, curated by Derek Adams and Louis, Louisa Monera. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I just had a, a the show. Solo. Optimism? Huh? Optimism. Oh, yeah. I just had a solo exhibition at Young Arts, which, you know, the Young Ar National Young Arts Foundation on Biscayne, and it was curated by Derek Adams and Louisa Monera. And it was my first solo show in Miami, and it was a great opportunity. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, and congrats, Mark. What's been really interesting with the um, current exhibition is actually seeing Creole in text on the wall and also in the actual right. work. And I was really curious, and not just as its own language, right, but also as another kind of visual language. And I was curious um, the role of Creole in your own work, in your own practice. <laughs> or the relationship to it. To the language itself? That's an incredible question. Um, <laughs> give me a quick second. <laughs> um, so I'll say from a museum educator point of view, um, I commend MOCA for going the extra mile to have the exhibition in Haitian Creole. Um, you know, at the, um, you know, museums are made for the community. Museums are places of conversations, uh, are places for open dialogue. And so um, one way to do that is by having text that is accessible to the community. Um, for me, um, I've dabbled a little bit in my title play. I know with Dear, a lot of his titles are in Haitian Creole. Um, and so that's one way of engaging the viewer to go beyond the physical the physicality of the work and having to, okay, what does this mean? Let me translate this. Um, and I think, you know, um, by, and then just in general as, as a um, language, you know, um, Haitian Creole is comprised of seven, uh, five to seven different languages from um, Spanish to Arabic to Taino. Um, and so um, because the language is so complex, um, it can take on different forms and shape. Um, so for me, at a basic level, is just adding it in certain titles of my work. I'd just like to add a little bit to that. Um, and not to necessarily disagree with what you're saying, uh, Morel, because I, you know, also, um, I think, I mean, I think I want to actually applaud Didier because I remember to actually having his artwork in Creole and emphatically not asking it to be translated. And I think when we had a conversation many, many years ago, we had talked about that. And I had said to him, do you want a little translation in the, um, in the title, and he'd said no. And I think that was really a kind of, another powerful kind of claiming space move, because museums oftentimes are not welcoming to people like us, right? They're not welcoming to black people, poor people, uh, queer pe people, et cetera. So to actually claim space, and to actually place your cultural heritage in a space that oftentimes requires you to not be your authentic self, so I think um, by not only having Haitian Creole at the title, but also saying I will not translate it <laughs> so that the person who reads it, who doesn't read Haitian Creole, is uncomfortable the very way in which we non-English speaking people also sometimes are com uncomfortable in spaces. So that kind of moment where you're uncomfortable, I applaud that and we, you know, I applaud that and I think that that's wonderful on his part, but also great that Mocha also did not um, asked for it to be translated. So in a way, really causing some people to feel a slight sense of discomfort in a space that many people have for many, many years felt discomfort. You know, so anyway, that's what I would suggest in terms of the Creole. Um, uh, and to add a little bit, um, I my photographs and my textiles, because of the where they exist, they haven't really had any language in it as much. Like. Um, some of the ones are about actual conversations, so the conversations were in English, so they're in English on the work, right? But with the umbrellas, um, which I can't believe I didn't bring that up in, when talking about it, but in the umbrellas written on them is Kaikule trompe soleil, many pas trompe la pluie, which means a leaky roof fools the sun, but it doesn't fool the rain. And for us, it was this metaphor for gentrification, right? This idea that um, a roof can be, have a hole in it, but until it rains, you don't know. And for me, that's what gentrification feels like. Like you're in this space and you're living comfortably and everything's fine until they start changing out sidewalks and doing little things here and there that make you question why because you've lived there for 20 years and they haven't done it. Um, and for us, it was really important to like, to do that. I taught Naja, who's American, she's from North Carolina. I taught her how to speak Creole as best as I could to get her to like say those things because I really wanted to be able to walk through little Haiti and have her be able to read it and she you know she does her best she's she's working on the accent you know um, but and for me it's like there's this 
there's this term in like um, Latin American in Latin cultures, like the no sabo kids, because they don't know how to say no habla. And so they like the joke is like they say no sabo. And so I, I kind of feel like that sometimes with Creole, even though I try as often as I can to continue using the language in my life. But there's this little bit of me that um, like like it's like what's the word like it's like a, I feel tongue tied sometimes. Um, when trying to speak Creole. And so sometimes it just doesn't translate into the practice. But, you know, I've been doing this project called Come et Manger, which I didn't bring it in here because it would have been a whole, a little bit too long. Um, and Come et Manger is all about like um, the African diaspora and like the language, the food, all of those things that kind of overlap within those spaces and kind of flattening it in a certain way. Um, if you are going through MIA, you can see it. <laughs> in the airport, um, and this idea of of how those two languages kind of exist throughout the diaspora. I, I mean, I could have made it longer by putting more languages in, but it didn't make sense. So it's there, but it's not like super prominent as of yet. Maybe in the future, as like I keep kind of like working with it and feeling less, um, feeling more like it's it's I'm allowed to, you know. Yeah. Um, within my work, when I with language, it depends on who I'm talking about. So growing up in my household, I spoke English to my dad and Creole to my mom. And so most likely when I make pieces about my mom, it's in Creole and in English about my dad or my siblings. And it just, I'm really bad at tiling pieces. So sometimes I, I will most likely, I'm, will, put it as untitled, but I know that's a lot of people's pet peeves to have untitled <laughs> in front of a piece. But I do a lot of, when I'm stuck on a piece or stuck and having an artist block, i really bad, but I write poetry about my work and I'm really bad at poems. Like my, my college professor, Chesia, was like, this is not for you, but you tried. <laughs> But um, I just write about my, my experiences with my family and some quotes that my mom would say or my aunts. And then that brings its way into what the piece is about and the title. Okay. All right, do we have any other questions? Well, okay. Thank you all. Thank you all. And I hope that you will join us for our next conversations at MOCA. That's actually going to be a Zoom because um, we're going to be exploring queer, black, and being Haitian, so we're connecting a lot of voices. It's on March 15th. It's my birthday. So please come on and tune in. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.